here too. All right, chemistry and biochemistry. Fun times. All right, so I, my, my hope is that in this next section, that the first part of it is a review of high school for you, and we can go pretty quickly. So matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. And some of you are my age, and you watch Bill Nye, and we know that matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. But that's what matter is. There's three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. So I, everybody okay with that? Like you're like, oh, not comfortable? <laughs> We're good? Next. Okay. In the human body, we have a lot of elements, but the four most uh, major elements that we find in the highest abundance or the most highest concentration are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And we'll learn shortly why carbon. But carbon is probably the most um, abundant uh, element in our body. Of course, hydrogen and oxygen with water. Nitrogen is what we use for proteins in DNA. So... Uh, and at the high school, once we get things going, because we memorize it, we rem remember that as Chon. So those, those four. Then we have what we call um, still. There's still needed elements, but they're in in a much smaller amount that we need them. But if we're missing them, do we suffer? Yes. And if we have too much, we also suffer. So that's where that homeostatic thing comes into play. And the one I want to point out most of all here is calcium. Because calcium is going to be the element that we come back to over and over and over again. Because in the most random places, you need calcium. And that's also why your skeletal system is so extremely important is because guess what it's really good at storing? Calcium. And when your body needs calcium, like it does right now, if you don't have a diet high in calcium, guess where your body takes it from? Your bones. It will literally break your bones down to pull the calcium out, and you'll have a weaker skeleton. And we'll continue to do that. So calcium will be one that we'll come to back to over and over again. We'll mention iron and iodine as we go, but it's mostly going to be calcium. Again, these are elements that you need, but you just don't need as much of them. Then we have the what we call trace elements. Trace elements we find in very, very small amounts, but we need them. And if we don't have them, we have a deficiency or we have an issue with them. Um, so it gives you just a few lists of these. You and I are not going to have to have these memorized, but you are going to need to be able to answer a question on the first two. And um, the question may say, like, which of the following is one of the four most abundant elements in the human body? So you need to get that from that first slide, and then another listing off of the, one, the nine one right one before this. Um, in here, you and I aren't even going to talk about much of the deficits that we will see as a result, or what we will experience as a result of not having too many of these. We are going to reference them in their enzyme form because uh, they're acting as coenzymes, but we'll get there eventually. Nonetheless, you need these. All right, so this next section is protons, neutrons, and electrons. I'm hoping that we don't have to spend a whole bunch of time on this. But um, back in the day when we taught chemistry, or you were in a chemistry class, the teacher like drew a circle, was like, this is an atom. And here in the center, you have protons, that have what type of charge? Thank goodness. Okay. And then you have neutrons that have no charge. Very good. No charge, which is why they're called neutrons. And then on the outside orbits, you have electrons, yes, which have a negative charge. Okay, and if you didn't know that, that's why I drew that here. Because some of you are like, oh, I get it. And some of you are like, I don't remember that. Okay, there are a few of these questions on your test, which is why I do need to go over this. But when you have an atom, your protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus of that atom. And this is, this right here is not living. Okay, this is, this is as at an element. Like an atom and an element are the terms that are interchangeable. Protons and neutrons are found in the uh, nucleus and then electrons are out there on that orbit. There are specific numbers. I just used that to draw them for you. So we mentioned that neutrons have no charge, that protons have a positive charge. Okay. 
Electrons are on the outside orbit and they carry a negative charge. The number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. The number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. You don't need to know all that. The number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. Okay? So, for example, here in this helium atom, we have two protons. Guess how many electrons we have? Two, right. In the event that we lose those <coughs> electrons, that atom becomes unbalanced and it becomes reactive. And we'll talk about that. We'll speak on that in just a moment. Um, all this is doing here is giving you different ways to depict the models. You don't have to know those. I'm just telling you why those look slightly different. Different ways of modeling them. Okay? Um, when you read a uh, periodic table of elements, that's what this slide is referencing that each of those elements is given a number, and the number is their atomic number is always the number of protons that they have. And we'll talk about that on a future slide, but this is referencing how we identify elements. Elements are identified by the number of protons that they have. Number of protons. So for example, hydrogen is the first element. It, ha it has an atomic number of one, so guess how many protons it has? One. And the number of protons will always equal number, number of electrons. So how many electrons does it have? One. Helium has an atomic number of two. How many protons? How many electrons? Two. Okay? So you can see where I'm going with this. And did I mention the neutrons, though? Not yet. Okay? Because the number of neutrons can fluctuate. But in a balanced al atom, or, uh, yes, that's what I needed to say, atom, the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. I have not said anything about neutrons yet. The atomic number, here it is defined in words, is the number of protons in the nucleus. We know that the number of protons will also give us the number of electrons. Okay, it does not say that here. But we learned that on a previous slide, the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. Okay? So um, here it's showing you one way. It's talking about lithium, and it's giving you the atomic number down there. You might see it depicted where on a periodic table. Where I'm going to use carbon because that's the one that we're going to reference again. But it has the C, and then it has a number on top, the atomic number, and then it will have a mass down here, the atomic mass. You'll have the exact same thing. It's just put on. It's it's flipped. The mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons. This is the first time we bring in neutrons. So I'm going to use carbon since I have this one right here. Carbon has how many protons? Six. How many electrons does carbon have? How many neutrons does it have? It does have six. How do you know it has six? The atomic number, wait, this is the atomic mass, I apologize. The atomic mass <coughs> is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if this number is 12, and I know that the number of protons is 6, I know that the number of neutrons I have is also 6. Okay? So using these two numbers here, you can calculate the number of each of the subatomic particles. So the number of protons will always equal the number of neutrons, so these two numbers will be equal. And the number of neutrons can be calculated by using this number. You take this number, subtract this number. Okay? And so atomic mass and atomic number. Or mass number and atomic number. Questions here or clarification? You will not have to calculate that. But I'm just <laughs> Every, just in case you don't know, for any of you who are studying, like, every biology class you take from this point on, the first chapter is an intro, the second chapter is chemistry in every biology book. If I could skip this chapter, I would, because we barely reference this at all, except for with calcium, sodium, and potassium, briefly. So the atomic number, mass number, and atomic weight are all put on the periodic table, and then you also 
we aren't going to draw pictures of each of those. In biology, we would make them. We would make models of them, but we're not in biology, we're in anatomy. And this allows us to identify each of those um, atoms or elements. The term isotope. The term isotope is defined as having a different number of neutrons. The term isotope is defined as having a different number of neutrons. Isotopes have a different number of neutrons. And I repeat it because you have to know that. Right here, I've given us two other versions of carbon. In the science world, we call this carbon-12 because it's got an atomic mass of 12. We call this carbon-13. Why? Atomic mass of 13. Yes. This is carbon-14. It's got an atomic mass of 14. Did the number of proteins change? Not proteins. Protons? Sorry, I, I'm going to mess up a lot. You can either front me out or pretend like you didn't hear it. I'll figure it out later and make fun of myself, so. I'm very comfortable making fun of myself. Um, and admitting that I make mistakes. Pretty consistent. Did the number of protons change? No, which is why I know this is still carbon. Because if the number of protons changed, it would be a totally different element. Okay? The number, the atomic mass changed, which means the number of <coughs> neutrons changed. So right here it has six neutrons. Right here it has... Seven, right here it has eight. These are considered isotopes because the number of neutrons changed. Why do I have to teach you this? Because if I continue to add neutrons, eventually this becomes radioactive. Guess what we use radioactive isotopes for? MRIs and imaging, when you have to take certain dyes so that they can run an MRI on you or to see if, every, if there's access to certain areas. Those are all radioactive isotopes. So that's where I'm getting at here. I'm not just randomly teaching you chemistry because I like chemistry, because I don't like chemistry. Okay. But when you have an isotope, you change the number of <coughs> neutrons. And as we continue to add neutrons, we make it radioactive. It becomes what we call a radioisotope. And we use those for MRIs, scanners, imagers, and things like that in order to diagnose our patients. Okay. So um, the atomic mass is the only, the atomic weight is the only thing that changes. The atomic number stays the same because, as you mentioned, if I change the atomic number, then I've changed the element altogether. All right? So we call it like carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14 because they're all carbons. They're just considered isotopes because they have a different number of neutrons. Okay? So here we've done it with hydrogen. Hydrogen... If you look at it on a periodic table of elements, hydrogen is one and one. How many protons does hydrogen have? One. How many electrons does it have? One, because the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. How many neutrons does it have? None. So this is what hydrogen looks like, proton and an electron, and that's it. But when I have this setup, one proton, so I have hydrogen, one electron, so I have hydrogen, but now I have a neutron, I now have an isotope because I've changed the number of neutrons. Did I change the number of protons? No, because if I change the number of protons, I would change the element altogether. Everybody okay with that? Tell me. I'm no, I was just wondering, like, how do you add that? How do I ask that? No, how do you add neutrons? Oh, in a controlled environment, in a laboratory setting. Because this all becomes radioactive, and like in cancer research, we use these radioactive isotopes to kill, can like when you have radiation therapies, literally that's what we're using. But the problem is, radiation doesn't know the difference between healthy and sick. So guess what it does? It kills them all. Yes, so you have to do it in a controlled laboratory setting. You can't just be like here, mix it in the kitchen, like type three. <laughs> this is something that's extremely controlled, and um, there's a lot of protective mechanisms that are put into play to, of, of course, keep you safe. Not that you even care, but the lady who discovered this actually died of ovarian cancer because she caused an outrageous amount of mutations in herself, but she didn't realize she was hurting herself while she was saving others. But, <coughs> good question. So radioisotopes, they become 
um, radioactive as we continue to add more neutrons. And as we do this, they, they form these spontaneous reactions, little tiny explosions. And they're great because we can pick them up on a scanner, like an MRI. And we can see, oh, there's a little explosion that just happened there. We know where this is. We can identify that area. Those people who are having fertility issues, they'll inject these dyes in order to follow whether or not the fallopian tubes are open, or if you're a male, to follow through the epididymis and the vas deferens to see that the sperm are capable of traveling the entire pathway. And we use those for diagnostic purposes, but we also use them for treatment purposes, like I was just mentioning. And we use them at, for, for radio, to, to do a radiation therapy, but the problem is, is that they damage everything. They can't distinguish between healthy and sick cells. So they kill both healthy and sick cells. So how do our patients feel when they undergo radiation? Terrible. What about when they undergo chemotherapy? I'm not using radiation, but I'm still using isotopes. They still feel sick. Because when you're going through that, you are killing cancer cells, and that's great, but at the exact same time, you're also killing perfectly healthy cells. But the goal is that we suffer for a short time for a long-term gain. That would be the purpose behind all that. Okay? And of course, we, we want to make sure that we're taking a lot of protective measures to keep everyone who uses this or who is uh, surrounded by this daily <coughs> from any type of side effect. I know that we have, there's a cancer unit right here at Baylor Scott and White. I don't know how many of you have been there, but those walls and that cancer unit are stupid thick. I think they're six feet thick, each wall, to make sure that the radiation doesn't get out to impact anybody who's working in the surrounding offices or any of the doctors or nurses that are caring for those patients. So, and, and those are just the walls that are surrounding that unit. Uh, they're that, I wanna say it's six feet. It may be eight, but I'm pretty positive it's six. <clears throat> okay, right here, um, the difference between the term molecule and compound is what this slide is really focusing on. A molecule is when you have two atoms that are the same joined together. So a molecule is when you have two atoms that are the same that are joined together, basically. I'm going to kind of change that in just a moment. So right here, like I have two hydrogens. Like we call this a hydrogen molecule, okay? <coughs> right here, I have 12 hydrogens, all right? And so these hydrogens are all put together. So I do, I do have multiple of the same atom put together, but they're also combined with others. So... A lot of times this can be considered a molecule. Most of the time we just use, we, we reference this as a compound. A compound by definition is different types of atoms joined together. So the reason why you're going to see this one in both categories is because people will argue that, oh, well, this is 12 hydrogens. They're the same, bonded together. Okay, so Technically, these can both, if you are going to argue that, they can both be considered a molecule. A compound is when we have different types of atoms bonded together. I reference it as molecule, same atom, compound, different atoms. Does anyone have any idea why this compound right here is so significant? Anybody know what that compound is? It is sugar. This is glucose. You need to memorize that. And we'll see it over and over again. It's not like it's, it's oh, well, one time and we're done. This is glucose, C6H12O6. C6H12O6 is glucose. So when someone says your glucose levels are low, that's what they're referencing. That's the compound, glucose. Okay. Is H2 considered a compound? No, H2 is strictly a molecule because that's two of the same. Questions on distinguishing between those two? Very well. Okay. Mixtures. Mixtures, when you put two things that are physically not together, you put them together. So like salt and water, oil and water, those are all mixtures, two things that are, are put together. So there's three types of mixtures, solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Literally, <clears throat> the main difference is whether or not it dissolves. If, when you put these two physical aspects together, they completely dissolve out, you have a solution. So they, they have mixed and there's no distinguishing features. So it's completely mixed, we have a solution. If you can still see the particles and they have not completely so, settled out, we have what we call a colloid. Jello is an ex excellent example of a colloid, okay? 
if I were to heat up Jello, would it separate out? Would the sugars and the dyes and stuff separate out if you heat up Jello? Or when Jello melts, does it eventually separate? Yes, yes it does. Okay. And um, eventually, if I were to heat this up, it will not separate out if it's in its Jello form, though. Does that make sense? If I leave it as Jello, it's not going to separate out because it's solid at this point. Here is where you have a suspension. A suspension is like putting oil and water, water together. Eventually, they're going to separate out. Like you could shake it together and you can kind of see where they're trying to mix, but they're going to eventually settle out. Right here, we have a test tube full of blood that has been through a centrifuge. So this is direct unsettled blood. So you just pulled this. This is you putting it through a centrifuge and the centrifuge will spin it very quickly. And you do that so that you can get the red blood cells and you can get hematocrit levels. You can also see the blood plasma here. And then we have what we call a buffy coat or a buffy layer, which depending on where it settles, that's either the platelets or the white blood cells. And it, it just depends on how you're going to separate them out. But your blood is considered, considered a suspension. Blood is not a solution where everything is nicely mixed. If your blood sits, it will clot. And it will pull out and separate itself out. So. That's all you had to know about those, is how to distinguish those. So solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Okay, and a mixture versus a compound. This is talking about whether or not there's chemical bonding. When salt and water dissolve, is there a chemical bond formed between salt and water? Is that a chemical reaction? No, that's just a mixture. A compound is when there's any type of bonding that occurs. So like when you have glucose, you have sugar, and you put that in, you start to mix other things together, then you start to form compounds, okay, where there's chemical bonding. Mixtures where there's no chemical bonding, it is, there's, they're physically together and they can physically be separated. A compound is where they're chemically put together and they'll have to be chemically separated. And we'll learn about that in just a moment. Okay. Do you know the difference between the, the roots homo and hetero? What does homo mean? Same. Yes, hetero means different, right? So homo would mean the same in origin and hetero would mean different. Okay. And when atoms, so this is taking us back to our atoms, when atoms are going to bond, form chemical bonds, they, use, they bond using their electrons. This is going to be a throwback. I'm hoping someone has the right answer. Does anybody know how many electrons can be in that very first shell? Two. Yes. The number of electrons that can hit this first layer right here is two. And this is what we're going to end up calling the octet rule. Okay, just so you know. What about each consecutive layer after that. It's actually called an orbit, not a layer. So I apologize for just calling it that if you're a chemist and you were offended by what I just said. I'll get emails. Don't think I won't. How many electrons can be in each concentric orbit after that? If the rule is octet, it is eight. Yes. So the first one is two, and each additional level can house eight. And I realize I put that on the wrong one. I'm just showing you. Okay, so it's two on the first one and eight in each additional orbit or valence shell. So that's what it says here. It's the rule of eight. Do you think an atom says to itself, I want to be full or I want to be empty? Which one do you think? It wants to be full. And until it's full, it is completely unbalanced, and it's really reactive. But as soon as it's full, guess what it does? It just chills out. Okay? So if... I'm going to show you a picture. Hopefully there's a picture on the next slide. No? Okay, here. Here is hydrogen. I know this is hydrogen because it has one proton, and as a result, it also has one electron. But how many does it want in this outer shell? Two. This only has one shell, so it wants two. So is this happy or not happy? <coughs> not happy. That's why hydrogen bonds to everything. 
Hydrogen likes oxygen because it can H2, oh, it'll bond to it. Okay? This is a lonely Adam. If I'm going to personify him, he is wanting to hook up with somebody to be balanced. Okay? Right here, it tells you that there are six electrons in this outer shell. Happy or unhappy? Unhappy. He's looking for someone with two. And look, hydrogen has one. So if I take on two hydrogens, I'll have two. So what they'll end up eventually doing is sharing these electrons and forming water. Because H2, O, yeah, O. All right, what about this guy right here? He's got one. <laughs> Very reactive. Yes. He's like, what? But is it easier for him to find seven or get rid of the one? Get rid of the one, and he'll eventually give that to potassium, sodium potassium, or sodium chloride, and they'll, they'll share those. Or he'll actually will end up calling an ionic bond. He'll give it away to um, chlorine, and that can make salt, so sodium chloride. Carbon. What do you notice about carbon? How many does it have? Four. So it's not full, but it, it doesn't know whether it should take on four or just get rid of four. That's why carbon is such a flexible element, and I will always go back to car carbon because everything we do is based on carbon, okay? Every aspect of you contains carbon. Yeah, that was my rhetorical question. <laughs> yes, yes, every bit of you, and we'll get there. So this is what it says here. The valent, if the valence shell is not full, so if the outer orbit is not full, it tends to gain, lose, or share electrons so that it become, can become stable. This is you in your not married life versus married life. You want to be stable. Long term. I'm not saying that you need to, if you are not ready to get married, you need to get married. So don't listen to me if I don't know you. Okay? Because um, you're probably like, what is she talking about? I think I'm done with this. Let me make sure. Molecular formulas. I'll bring an eraser the next time. Molecular formulas. So C6H12O6. What's that again? Glucose. So a molecular formula, when you hear that term, you're like, oh my gosh, a molecular formula. Literally, all that means is this. It tells you the number of molecules that are located in that compound. So that's the molecular formula. Molecular formula. Okay? Now, when we talk about uh, reactants versus products, when we start talking about chemical equations, I always teach my students that anytime a reaction is going to take place, there's going to be an arrow. And anything that is on the left side of the arrow is a reactant. Reactants go in. And anything on the right side of the arrow is considered a product. And products are released from that reaction. So anything on the left goes in, it's a reactant. And the product is what is created or is released from that. And no matter what, those numbers, the number of elements on each side or atoms on each side should be equal. But you are not going to have to balance those. In chemistry, you had to balance equations. Some of you are probably really good at that, um, but you don't have to do that here. So, question on the difference between reactants and products. Reactants go in, products come out. Okay? Here, this is what it's showing you. <clears throat> First of all, molecular formula, CH4. How many carbons are in that? One. And how many hydrogens? Four. And we know that there's four because there's a subscript four there that's telling us that. All right, reactants, I find my arrows. Anything on the left is a reactant. Anything on the right is a product. So right here I have two hydrogens. A reaction takes place. So my reactants, a reaction takes place, and here's my product. Do I still have two hydrogens? Mm -hmm. Yes, because the number, they have to stay the same. The numbers have to stay the same. It's just put in a different form. Mm -hmm. Here I have four hydrogens and a carbon. I mean, it is a reactant. The reaction takes place, and now I have methane. Do I still have one carbon? Yes. And do I still have four hydrogens? Yes. So they're balanced. 
You and I do not have to know these in specific details, but does everybody understand the basic concept? Very well. Synthesis, decomposition, and exchange. Synthesis is a fancy word. Does anybody know what synthesize means? To make or create. Anything synthesis, like photosynthesis, using light to create food. Synthesize means to create. So synthesis is to create. What's decomposition? Okay. To break down. So I taught you two words in chapter one, anabolic and catabolic. Which one is synthesis? Anabolic. Which one is decomposition? Catabolic. Okay. I am, con I am will not stop continuing to pull back what we've discussed in previous chapters because the more I say it, the more connections you're going to make. You need to know that synthesis is an anabolic reaction. We're making something to make or create. Anabolic steroids, what do they do to people? Make them bigger. They build up. Okay? Catabolism, catabolic, all of that is breaking down. It's decomposition. All right? I'm going to bring in two more words on that in just a moment. Exchange reactions. Exchange reactions say that we're not necessarily building up or break. We're, we're going to build up one molecule, break down another one. So they're just going back and forth. You're doing both synthesis and decomposition, not just synthesis or decomposition. You're doing both. So this is a synthesis reaction. I have A plus B. Are, is the A plus B a reactant or a product? How do you know it's a reactant? It's, at, it's on the left side of the arrow. All reactants will always be on the left side of the arrow. My product is AB. Do I still have an A? Do I still have a B? Yes. Okay. We consider this a synthesis reaction because something is being created. It's anabolic. We're creating something. Anabolic. <clears throat> in just a moment, and I'm going to use this because I'm here because I'm not going to have this in a moment. Anytime you build something... You always have to dehydrate it. Write that down. Anytime you build something, you always have to dehydrate it. Let me give you an example. Anytime you have to build something, you have to dehydrate it. What does dehydrate mean? Take, water. take the water out. Literally, that's it. If I want to build something, I have to take the water out. Some of you may have really fun snacks that you like that are super healthy, but sometimes you have snacks that are not healthy, like mine is cookie dough. I will make cookie dough because I prefer to eat cookie dough as opposed to the actual cookies. And the crazy thing is, is that my kids always hear me in the kitchen and they're like, what? Because I don't normally cook. Mine is like this. So if I'm in the kitchen, they know I'm probably making cookie dough. <laughs> but when you eat the cookie dough, it's super good, right? But then eventually I get full or it starts to hurt my stomach because I eat too much. And I make the rest like six cookies. Right? But when you put that cookie dough on the cookie sheet and you put it in the oven, what does the oven do to that cookie dough? It cooks it. When you say it cooks it, what is it doing? It's adding heat, and as a result of the heat, it's removing water. So it takes that liquidy cookie dough mix, dehydrates it, and creates solid bonds. I dehydrate it, and I form these bonds. I build something. That's an anabolic reaction. Okay? So I had the cookie dough, I put it in the oven, the oven heated it, removed the water, and it created a bond. That was an anabolic reaction. I created something. If I added water to that cookie, would it go back to the cookie dough? No. Sad day for that, for sure. All right. All right. In just a little bit, we'll talk about proteins, but these are individual amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. So these are individual and then I connect all of these amino acids and I build a protein. Guess what I have to do to connect each of these amino acids? If I'm going to build it, what do I have to do? I have to dehydrate it, take a water away. So between these two, I removed one water, so one H2O drop had to be removed in order for these two to join. I removed one. So for every single bond you want to form, you have to remove one water. Okay. It's going to come up later in the notes. I'm just using these pictures so that I'm not using just a word in a moment. Okay. So for each of these, I have to remove one water. So if I have ten bonds, how many waters did I remove? Ten. Okay. It's a one-to-one. -one. 
decomposition. What's my reactant here? A, B. What's my product? A plus B. And that's because it's on the right side of that arrow. So I've clearly taken something that was built, put together, and I've separated it. Okay? So I decomposed it. I broke those bonds. This is a catabolic reaction. What do you think I had to add to break those bonds? Water. If I take the water away, I create a bond. But if I add a drop of water, I dissolve that bond. That is exactly right. We're going to end up calling that hydrolysis. So it's hydrolysis. And I'm going to show you that word in a moment. But adding water breaks things down. Another case in point, I like red velvet cake, but as soon as I, I don't like the dough for that, just so you know. But I'll make it, and my kids will smell it. Freaking kids. And as soon as it gets out of the oven, I quickly put the cream cheese icing on it, and I cut out the middle piece, and I hide the middle piece. Because that's the piece that I want. I know, you don't have four kids if you don't hide your food. Okay. I may have problems. Anyways. I'll eat, and when it cools down, I'll eat that. But the kids, they'll smell it, they'll be like, oh my gosh, this is cake. And they'll eat it, but they don't put it on a plate. I know your kids are perfect, and they cut it out and put it on a plate and eat it with a fork at the table. But my kids just get a fork out of the drawer and eat it out of the pan. Uh -huh. And then when it's all gone, they wash and dry the dish. No, they don't. They just leave it there. And then my husband comes in, and he's mad because the dishes aren't done. And I'm like, I didn't eat that cake. The kids did that. I didn't do that. And he's like, is nobody going to do the dishes? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I guess I'll do the dishes. So I'll take that pan, because I'll let it sit overnight, because I didn't leave it there. My kids need to put it up, right? I'm trying to be a good parent and teach them to do stuff, but I'm also being lazy at the same time. I know you never do stuff like that. Anyways, when I finally decided to, to wash it, you can't just start scrubbing it, because it sat there overnight, and it dehydrated. Right? So it's stuck to the side. So if I immediately start scrubbing it, that's going to be a lot of work. What does it need to do? It needs to soak it. Oh, I, I'll add water. I'll see y'all in an hour. I'm going to go do some <laughs> for an hour. Um, so I hydrolyzed it. I added water. I broke all those bonds. It will loosen all that food. And then when I go back, how long does it really take to break all those bonds? Not that long. It's like five minutes max. But I always say it's an hour, and my kids believe me because I'm a science teacher, right? Like, Mom knows everything. I do. But I also know that it doesn't take an hour, but I want an hour to not have to wash the dishes. I, you guys don't deal with that, and I realize that my family's not perfect, but anyways, now you know. So here I have my red velvet cake stuck to the pan because it dehydrated and so it's all together so all these waters were removed creating bonds but for every bond that I want to break guess what I have to do I have to add a water so I added one drop of water here one there and it lysed all those bonds and it broke it all up and it made it easier to get rid of so if I want to build things I take the water away and that's anabolic and if I want to break things down I add water and that's catabolic any confusion Okay? Exchange reactions. Exchange reactions say that at the same time I'm breaking something down, I'm also building something up. So I'm decomposing on one side and I'm synthesizing on the other. So I'm breaking down and building up at the same time. What is my reactant in this equation? A, B plus C. We know that's the reaction re reactant because it's on the left side of the arrow. And then A, C plus B is my product. Okay? We're both synthesizing and decomposing at the same time. So am I adding water or taking water away? If I'm synthesizing and decomposing at the same time, am I adding water or am I taking water away? Adding and taking it away. Yes, absolutely. So you're doing both. You're doing both. Okay, so this is giving you an example using, do you remember what ATP is? Energy. Energy. If for the rest of your life, you're, you leave my class, you will be thinking about ATP. Not ran, It's going to be a random thought, not like you're driving thinking about ATP. But eventually you're going to be like, ATP, oh my gosh. 
ATP is the energy that allows you to do anything. But as soon as you use it, it's like a lightning bug. So as soon as that lightning bug uh, brights up, immediately it does what? It dims out. Like it, it, it has that just enough energy to make that one spark. Literally, one molecule of ATP gives you exactly that much energy because that's what causes a lightning bug to spark. But you don't have to know that. All right? And then guess what that lightning bug has to do before it can spark again? It has to recharge. Guess what you have to do before you can have more energy? You have to recharge. So we'll use that energy, and then we'll immediately re-energize it. And then we'll use it, and then we'll re-energize it. And we'll use it, and we'll re This is a cycle that you and I are going through right now, whether you're super active or not. Okay? What affects the rate of your chemical reactions? If you're hot, what happens to your chemical reaction? Speeds up or slows down? Speeds up. Speeds up. We talked about that. So we increase the temperature, we increase the rate. If we increase the amount that we put in, guess what we do to the rate of the reaction? If you increase the amount of gasoline you pour on a fire, what happens to your fire? It gets bigger, so it increases it. Okay? If the particles are small, it'll work faster. But what if the particles are really big? It works slower. Okay? So small particles are easily dissolved, like salt and water. So that's what these arrows are showing you, increase and decrease. I didn't create these notes. Sometimes I don't like them. Sometimes I do. Okay? A catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction. We're going to talk about those in a moment because they are enzymes. You have to know about enzymes for this test and for this entire, everything that we study in anatomy. Enzymes are biological catalysts. A catalyst, by definition, is anything that speeds up a reaction. Enzymes are biological catalysts. A catalyst, by definition, is anything that speeds up a reaction. Enzymes are biological catalysts. All right, biochemistry. So that was it on chemistry. Now biochemistry. What, how is biochemistry different than regular chemistry? Yep, bio just means life. Okay, so biochemistry is going to pertain to everything that we study that's living, and we can divide that into organic and inorganic. What's the difference between organic and inorganic? Carbon, carbon literally, that's it. If something is organic, it has carbon. If something is inorganic, it does not have carbon. You will hear most younger people say, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not old for sure, but a lot of times when you hear organic because it's so um, instilled in our society right now, if it says organic, they're like, it's healthy. If it's organic, it's healthy. And literally, by definition, organic just means it has carbon. Okay, so if something is organic, it has carbon. If something is inorganic, guess what it doesn't have? Fantastic. So inorganic compounds are like water, salts, acids, bases, do not have carbon. Organic compounds, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. And they have carbon. What's, does anybody know what a carbohydrate is? What is it? When we say carbs, what are carbs? Sugars. Carbs is fancy for sugars. Fat. What about lipids? Fats. Lipid is fancy for fat. Protein is fancy for... Protein. Proteins are proteins. What about nucleic acids? What is nucleic acid? You're full of it. Nucleic acid. DNA and RNA. Is that what you were going to say? Yes, sir. And yes, ma'am. DNA and RNA. Nucleic acid is your DNA and your RNA. ATP is also nucleic acid. But anyways, you need both organic and inorganic. Uh, compounds for, for your body and your body. For example, water, you have to have water, which is what it's about to say right here. There you go. Water is an inorganic compound found in every single living organism. We need it. The majority of our volume is composed of water. Water is really, really good at conducting electricity, which is great because guess what we run on? Electricity. Electricity. So it conducts electricity. When we tell our... Uh, when we say wiggle our toe, it gets there really quickly if we're adequately hydrated. If you're dehydrated, guess what doesn't happen? 
It doesn't happen as quickly. Acids versus bases. I had a horrible chemistry teacher, which is probably why I hate chemistry. But if my chemistry teacher would have taught me that if you have an acid, it just has a whole bunch of hydrogens, period. That's all that means. If you have a base, you have a whole bunch of hydroxides, period. Guess what happens if you, so let me, if you have an equal number of hydrogens as hydroxides? Does anybody know what this makes? Oxygen is there, yes. Water. H2O. If you have a bunch of hydrogens, you have an acid. If you have a bunch of hydroxides, you have a base. But if you have an equal amount of them, you have water. You're neutral. Guess where our body wants us to be? Where's homeostasis? Right around neutral. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Our homeostatic level pH is 7,4. So it's slightly basic. When we have a bunch of hydrogens, we have acids. When we have a bunch of uh, hydroxides, we have bases. I think I just said that right. I mean, did I just say bases here? Maybe I just thought it in my head. Sometimes I, I'll catch myself if I mess up. Sorry. Okay, so in our bodies, of course, we're trying to maintain homeostasis. So what happens if our blood pH has too much acid in it. What does our body do? It tries to neutralize it immediately. Immediately. Because you and I have to stay within a specific range. If you know somebody who is diabetic and they don't eat for a really long time and their sugar levels are out of control, what, what sends them into a coma? Does anybody have any idea? We call it keto. So what sends them into a coma? The acidity. Their blood pH becomes so acidic that their organs can't function. And if somebody doesn't get to them quick, what happens to that individual? They expire, for sure. Yes. So we have, we have to stay in this range. And it's like 725 to 745 is that, that range. If it gets too acidic, we start getting super sick. If it gets too basic, we start getting super sick. And if we don't fix it, either way, whether we're too acidic or too basic, we're going to die. Okay? So the, another term for um, basic is alkaline. So if you hear it say alkaline, whatever. When you have an equal amount of both hydrogens and hydroxides, so I have hydrogen and hydroxides, then you have neutral. Acidity is defined. Many of you have probably seen the pH scale. I think it's on the next slide, so I'm not going to draw it. But this is like 0 to 6.99, and then neutral is 7, and then bases are 7.01 to 14. So the bigger the number, the more basic it is. So when we, I said our pH, and I said 7.25 to 7.45, because we're each a little bit unique, and your pH is probably not exactly what, what mine is or the person next to you. Okay, so here is the pH scale. This was in your books all through growing up and in your book now too. Surprise! All right, here's neutral. The deal is when you're looking at these pH scales is you need to figure out which direction it's, it's oriented. A lot of them go from acidic to basic, but this one clearly goes from acidic to basic. It goes in the reverse direction, okay? Fine neutral, the smaller numbers are acidic, the larger numbers are basic. And it also uh, correlates individual household items so that you understand what's acidic and what's basic. Does your body, if you, get, if you become acidic, does your body require you to fix it or does it try to fix it itself? It will fix it itself, yes. You, carbon dioxide is kept in your body because it will make a bicarbonate buffer and it will take care of you to an extent. If you 
if you don't take care of yourself, well then negative feedback will be overwhelmed and it will cause positive feedback and then you will expire. We talked about that in chapter one. Your body will try to fix it first. It always does. You're, you are your body's main focus. What do you think neutralization is? Don't overthink it. Bless you. Neutralization. What do you think I'm trying to reach? Water. The pH of zero. So I'm either going to add, if it's too basic, I'm going to add acids. And if it's too acidic, I'm going to add bases. That's what's going to happen. So I'm just trying to neutralize it. I'm trying to get it to a balanced pH, something around 7. Why is pH such a big deal for us? There are two things that will shut you down very quickly, temperature and pH. Those are the two things that will wipe you out very quickly. Your temperature goes outside. The highest that you can maintain a temperature for an extended period of time and minimize damage is 104. When you hit 105 or higher and it's extended for four to five hours, you're causing irreversible damage. With your blood pH, we have the same thing. You can go outside of our homeostatic range slightly for a short time, but for an extended time, that's inconsistent with life. The two things that will knock you off real quick will be pH or temperature. So a slight change in pH can be fatal. This can include anything that um, it could be an injection or it could be that you haven't eaten in a really long time. Anything that manipulates your pH just a little bit will cause problems. However, as I mentioned, your body will try to bring yourself back to homeostasis. Your kidneys, they'll try to retain water or salts and help with that. Your lungs, that carbon dioxide I was talking about, the bicarbonate buffers, these both continue, or, uh, help us to create chemical buffers that will allow for our blood pH to maintain homeostasis. Two things that will damage you, and the way they damage you, look at this. It says it, I should probably read my slides. pH change interferes with cell function. If the cell isn't functioning right, what has happened to it? If its function has changed, its structure has changed. pH and temperature are the two things that can change the structure. You change the structure, you change its function. Two interdependent terms. It cannot be separated. You have four organic compounds. Well, you have a lot of organic compounds, but the four that you and I talk about that we get from our food or outside sources are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We already said that carbohydrates are sugars, lipids are fats, proteins are proteins, and nucleic acids are DNA and RNA and ATP. The difference between the term poly and mono. What does mono mean? One. Mono means one, and poly means many. Question. So if I have two singles, two monomers, and I want to join them together, what can I do? If I have two separate and I want to join them together, I can take out water. Is this anabolic or catabolic? Anabolic. It's anabolic because I had two separate and I built them together. So it's anabolic. Is that synthesis or decomposition? Synthesis. We just use three different words talking about the exact same thing. Do you understand what I'm saying and why terminology is such a big deal? We dehydrated it, which caused a synthesis reaction, which overall is anabolic. Dehydration, synthesis, and anabolic, all together the same. So if I have two monomers and I want to bring them together, I dehydrate them. That's a synthesis reaction. It's anabolic. We call it dehydration synthesis. Why do we call it dehydration synthesis? Just dissect the word. Science, it, after we get through this, I'm taking out water and I'm creating something. My goal is after chapter two, we will start dissecting words. Like I'll give you a word and you'll look at it and go, like, ah, and I'll say, just figure out what it means. If you can take that word and break it up, you can figure out exactly what it means. And even when your doctors are talking to you, you'll, by the end of this course, you'll go in and listen to them speak and you'll know what they're talking about. I guarantee it. What have you said? 
you just, even maybe if you passively listen, you might get some of it. But dehydration synthesis, I'm just dehydrating it, taking water out in order to create something. That's all that means right there. Okay, so what if I have a whole lot that are joined together and I want to break them up? I'm going to add water. It's catabolic, and this is a decomposition reaction. Does that make sense? So monomers are singles. I join monomers to make polymers, and polymers are a lot, and I break polymers apart to make monomers. So poly is many, mono is one. Hydrolysis reaction. Hydro lysis. What's hydro? Water. Lysis means to cut or lyse or separate. Okay, so hydrolysis. Questions or clarification right here? Okay, this is showing you exactly what I just depicted using my fingers. I have two <laughs> monomers that are separate. Are those reactants or products? How do you know the reactants? The left side of the arrow, bottom line, non-negotiable. I have reactants, and it has the H2O highlighted here. And then what is this arrow telling you that it's doing? You cannot, you cannot understand how important arrows are. So many people will answer this question wrong. The arrow is showing you the water is leaving. Okay. I feel like it's very straightforward, but you will, not you, or hopefully, but you will still get it wrong. Okay, and I'll be like, what? It's clear. We took the water out and we created a bond. Here, I have something that's already bonded. Guess what I'm doing? Adding water, and as a result, it's breaking apart. Okay, here I have exchange reactions where I can take water out and create a molecule, or I can add water and break it apart. Okay, so can go either way. Questions on how to read that? Very well. Okay, so now the four biomolecules. Carbohydrates are fancy for sugars. Sugars are when they're super small. Starches are when they're really big. So anything that says sugars or starches, that's a carb. Okay, all carbohydrates have the three of those four main elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. What does mono mean again? One. Saccharide is just sugar. So monosaccharide means one sugar. Disaccharide means two. And poly means many. Okay, when you eat Snickers, the chocolate is a monosaccharide. But the peanuts are polysaccharides. They're really, really big. That's why Snickers are such a diverse food, because it gives you quick energy, but also long-term energy, because of the different components that it includes. Okay, what is... What do we use carbohydrates for? What do we use sugars for? Energy. energy, literally. Energy. You and I specifically. So it says here cellular fuel. We use carbohydrates for sugars. Okay? Um, we also use carbohydrates in our DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA both have sugar. Okay? So that's what it means. They're all structural. So here it just goes through and it talks about uh, monosaccharides being a simple sugar. So monosaccharides are the smallest a carbohydrate can be. All right? The only reason I want you to pay attention to this slide is because glucose is a monosaccharide. Glucose is a monosaccharide. Glucose is one sugar. Glucose is one sugar. Okay, so here's examples of monosaccharides. When they are the smallest, they can go right to work for you. Two sugars. You and I cannot digest two or we can digest it. We cannot utilize disaccharides. We have to break them down. Real quick question. Some of you talk about that you have high protein diets to others, not to me because I don't have conversations with you yet. Um, but when you have a high protein diet, let's say you eat a whole lot of chicken. When you eat that chicken, is that chicken protein going to go to work in your body right then? No, because what you just ate was chicken protein. So if you're not a chicken, that protein's not going to do you any good until you catabolize it. You have to take all that chicken protein 
that's really big and you have to break it down into individual monomers for a protein. So you have to cat catabolize it and then when it's all super small, then you can use it to make just the proteins or the proteins that you need for yourself. So when you eat food, unless you get it in its most simple form, it will not go to work in you right then. You have to give it time. But if you just take glucose straight, it'll give you energy right then. That's why like sodas and stuff like that give people energy really quickly because it's simple sugars. But what if you eat a really big sugar like pasta? What does that do to you? After you go eat at Olive Garden, what do you want to do? Go to sleep. Yeah, because it filled you up, but it didn't give you energy because you're full now you want to go to sleep. Okay? It wouldn't be the same if you ate something that was just full of simple sugars. Okay? So disaccharides, because they're complex, we have to take a while to break them down before we can get them to go to work for us. So lactose, sucrose, and maltose are all examples of disaccharides. So dyes to sugars. And I'm going to kind of go through that fast because you don't necessarily have to know all that. Polysaccharides means you have a very large amount of sugar. Because you have a lot of sugar, it takes a really long time to build, break down. If you're an athlete of any type, your coaches didn't give you pastas before you had a game. Why? It slowed you down. When did you eat pasta? The night before. Call it carb loading. We would feed you a whole bunch of high carbohydrate foods the night before. And then that way it gave your body a chance to break it all down so the next day you would have all this ready energy and fuel to go throughout. So that was the science behind that. We call it carb loading. Your coaches may or may not have called it that, but that's exactly what it is. Okay, so polysaccharide. Because I have each of these complex bonds, for each bond, what did I have to do? I had to take a water out. Anytime there's a bond, we took a water out. I'm just throwing back on you. If, if I keep going over it, it'll stick in your head. You'll be talking to your dog about this later on. <laughs> right, next biomolecule, lipids. And the reason why I teach you carbs first is because carbohydrates are the first thing that you burn for energy. So when you go to work out, the very first thing, when you wake up in the morning, the very first thing you're burning is carbohydrates. Once you've burned all your ready source of carbohydrates, then you burn your fats, your lipids, which is why we teach those second. The problem with this is, is that people will go work out for like 10 or 15 minutes. They'll do a brisk walk, and they'll be like, oh, I just worked off all the fat that I just ate. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. In fact, you didn't work off any fat. Um, you don't really get to fat until about 30 minutes into your workout. Okay? And you don't have to be doing a super high-intensity workout, but you have to be doing something active for longer than 5 or 10 minutes in order to get to the fats because you have to burn all your carbs first. There's a lot of different types of fats. The fats that we talk about the being that cause you to get fat that I was just referencing right there, what we call neutral fats or triglycerides. Phospholipids are a fat that you can never get rid of because these are found in your cell membranes, and I'm going to teach you that on Thursday. Steroids, these are hormones um, like testosterone, estrogens, progesterone, so you can't get rid of those either. Any eicosanoids or eicosanoids, also you cannot get rid of those. So these are ones you can't get rid of. These are the ones that usually bothersome um, that you try to manipulate. Also, something to point out, the four element, or of the four elements, the main elements, there's only three found in lipids. Carbohydrates, not carbohydrates. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. No nitrogen in carbs or fats. What do we use lipids for? The main reason we use fats is for energy. Main reason. Okay, but if, I, if my body has a choice to use fats or sugar for energy, which one's it going to use? Sugar, because it's easier. Okay, it's going to have to work to get energy out of fat. But it will, when it runs out of sugars, then it will go for the fats. We also use fat for insulation and protection, so to maintain uh, body heat and homeostasis, as well as to protect our viscera. What's viscera? Organs, fantastic. And this is what a fat looks like. I'd say they look like flags. I didn't tell you, but carbohydrates look like little stop signs, like they're pentagons or hexagons. Fats look like flags, and they're just all oily and flaggy. Saturated fats, 
saturated versus unsaturated? Which is the good one? Unsaturated. Heart healthies are your unsaturated. The difference between saturated and unsaturated in a quick reference. Saturated are solid at room temperature. Because they're solid at room temperature, guess what they do in your vessels? They stick. Because they're solid at room temperature, they stick in your blood vessels. Unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. So whenever they're in your vessels, they don't get stuck. They just flow through. So when you cook with like olive oils, corn oils, and stuff like that, those are unsaturated fats. But when you cook with Crisco, unsaturated. Okay? So these are the ones that your body likes because they're healthy. Your body likes the way these taste, but they're not so healthy for you. Okay? Um, the difference in structure is in an unsaturated fat, instead of being linear, it's kinked. You don't have to know that for this class, but it's a structural difference. Okay? There's the linear versus kinked. Steroids. Steroids are um, like your hormones. Like I mentioned, testosterone, estrogens, progesterone. It also includes your cholesterols. Um, you use cholesterol. When people say cholesterol, immediately they think like bad fats and stuff like cholesterol level is high because that's you're not supposed to have a lot of it. But you do need cholesterol for your cells to maintain their shape and um, their integrity. So cholesterol is something that you do need. You just don't need a whole lot of it. Okay? So steroids are a type of lipid. Okay? Just the structure of a steroid. Eicosanoids or eicosanoids. Okay? These are different types of fats. But the, and because they're different types of fats, they, they serve different types of roles. So their structure, is, their structure determines their function. But one of the main roles that we have here is that of a prostaglandin, which works in blood clotting. Okay, so do I want to get rid of eicosanoids or eicosanoids? No, because I need them in order for my blood to clot. Okay, it helps us control blood pressure. It mentions that there, inflammation, and we'll talk about the inflammatory response um, next week, not this week. Labor contractions, oxytocin, all of that, they're all uh, carried out by different hormones that are derived from fatty acids. Other fats, uh, well, we have fat-soluble vitamins. Vitamins themselves are not fats. But A, D, E, and K, those are vitamins that are lipid-soluble, so our cells like them. It's easy for them to get in. Lipoproteins, what does lipo tell you? And then protein, like I have a lipoprotein, so what do I have there? A fatty protein. I literally have a protein that's transporting fats. So that's what a lipoprotein is. If you can take these terms and start dissecting them, you will find that you'll be very successful, not only on the tests and the labs, but as you get out and start practicing. Proteins, so that's the next one. Do you use proteins for energy? No. But if you've burned all your carbohydrates and you've burned all your fats, so you've burned all your lipids, you will go to proteins next. If you're metabolizing, bless you, proteins for energy, you're in bad shape. Like you should be probably hospitalized at that point because you've starved and you're, this is bad. Where's, where, what is your body going to use protein nature in order to give you fuel? What is it going to break down? Your muscle. Your muscle. Yes, ma'am. That is exactly correct. Notice the four, all four of those main elements are found in proteins. Remember, in carbohydrates and lipids, we didn't have nitrogen, but now we have nitrogen there. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And proteins are all polymers, so there's no small proteins. But the smallest piece of a protein is what we call an amino acid. And many of you, I, I, I would venture to say all of you have heard the term amino acid. You're like, oh, this food has amino acids. What that means is... is if you use an amino acid supplement or you t take amino acid shakes, whatever it is that you do, amino acids, amino acids can go to work in your body right now, immediately, versus taking on a whole protein. If you take on a whole protein, I have to break it down, and then I can use it to build up. But if you do a protein shake or anything like that, it's full of amino acids. So the amino acids can go to work right then and start working for you. You don't have to break so the amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. Okay, so just different. You only have 20 amino acids. There's only 20 amino acids on Earth. So there's only 
20 different amino acids that can make all of your proteins. So this is just a few of them. Okay. Ooh, I'm just a teaching moment. Reactants or products? Reactants are on the left side. If I read it, the top reaction. Is this dehydration or hydrolysis? Dehydration, because I'm removing water. As a result, what type of reaction is this if I've removed water? Syn is synthesis, or you could even use the word synthetic, will also work as well. Anabolic or catabolic? Anabolic. It built up. Okay, now I have this structure here, and I'm going to read the bottom reaction. Hydrolysis or dehydration? Hydrolysis, because I'm adding water, and as a result, catabolic reaction or decomposition. Yes, I've broken that down. Okay. The term denaturing or protein denaturation means I have changed its shape. If I change a protein shape, guess what I have done? Change Bottom line. Non-negotiable. I change its shape, I change its function. So... What's the last thing I want to do with the protein? Change its shape. Because as soon as I change its shape, I have now changed its function. There are two things that can change the shape of a protein. I bet you don't know what they are. Temperature and pH. T temperature and pH. Temperature and pH. The only two things that can change the shape. Those change the shape, they change the function. Okay? So you're, all of that, this is all stuff we've learned today that we've applied in multiple places. These are non-negotiables consistent across the board. Change the shape, change the function. Temperature and pH will change your shape immediately and then change that function as a result. If it's something really short-term, like a short-term fever, usually the damage is reversible. But what happens if it's long-term? It creates re irreversible damage and then in the event that you do survive, there will be complications. And it uses, and I don't like that it uses this, but like cooking an egg. Once you've cooked an egg, can you uncook it? No, but eggs are very high in protein, and that's what you're using that for. But like, you don't cook your brain. Anyways, whatever. You can't untoast the toast. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. You can't untoast the toast. Words of wisdom. K-E-R-A. I, I, I love you some PBS kids. K-E-R-A. All right. Enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. I'm going to say that like four times. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. One more time. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. I used the term catalyst earlier. And I said catalyst is anything that really speeds up things. Enzymes, anytime you see the word enzyme, it immediately tells you it's a protein. Immediately. So when the question says, you have this enzyme, what biomolecule is it? Did you have four choices? Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, or nucleic acids? An enzyme is a protein that speeds up a reaction. Anytime you hear something, oh, I'm taking this enzyme. The reason you're taking the enzyme is because it speeds up a reaction. That's it. So enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. It mentions here that they lower activation energy. Activation energy means the energy necessary to do work. So it speeds it up. This is the example I give to my students. If I'm 400 pounds and I want to weigh 100 pounds, can I get there naturally? Can I change some things and eventually lose that much weight? The answer is yes, I can. That's going to take a lot of work, true or false. I'm going to have to modify my diet. My lifestyle is going to have to completely change. I'm going to have to do a lot more physical activity. But can I do it? Yeah. Give me a time frame. I would say 18, 24 months, yes. And that would be trying to do it healthy the right way. Now, that's me doing it naturally. An enzyme is a protein that speeds up a reaction. I'm 400 pounds and I want to weigh 100 pounds. I, it can be done much faster. True or false? 
you, okay, yeah, you can just chop it off, which I don't know how that, that would work. But, and just real quick, I do not know of a diet pill that does this or anything like that, so don't be like, hey, what pill were you talking about? Because it's not a thing. I'm just using it as an example, okay? But let's say that I decided to take a diet pill, and after a week of taking one diet pill each day, I've lost five pounds. I'm like, oh, heck yeah. So what do I do the next week? You're right. You take two. And by the end of the second week, I've lost 10 pounds. So 15 pounds in two weeks. I'm like, yeah. What do I do that third week? I, I go, I'm going to go for three. Okay, I'm losing this weight. I like it. I'm still eating my full pound of brownies, my whole pizza to myself, my red velvet cake, and my cookie dough. I'm doing all of that. And I'm losing this weight with these pills. So the third week, I take three pills each day, but I still only lose 10 pounds. So now I'm bobbled. Because I took two pills and lost 10 pounds, but I took three pills and also just lost 10 pounds. There is a point when your body says, I can't go any faster. Okay? So you reach what we call saturation limit. But what did that diet pill ultimately do to me? Did it help me lose my weight? Will I lose it much faster? Yes. And I can continue to do that and lose those 10 pounds each, each week using those two pills. What it did was it lowered the amount of work I had to put into it. I didn't have to work out. I didn't have to change my eating habits. I didn't have to do any of that. I just had to take the pill. So that's what an enzyme does. It lowers the amount of work your body has to do. Enzymes are chemical or enzymes are proteins that speeds up reactions. It increases the rate of the reaction. That's what they do. That's what their job is. So in my example, a diet pill would be an example of an enzyme. Okay? Here is showing you. Here's me trying to lose weight without taking a diet pill. There's a whole lot of work required in order to get to where I want to be. Here's me using the diet pill. How much work did I have to do? Not nearly as much, and I still got the exact same result. Yes. And here, the only thing I want to point out on this is that enzymes usually end in these three letters, A-S-E. So... For example, if you are lactose intolerant, it's because you're lacking lactase. And lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. So when you take in lactose, because you can't break it down, it stays in your guts longer, or your intestines, actually your colon, and you fart a lot because you can't break it down. It's a fact. That's what happens. But if you know you're lactose intolerant, you can take these little chewable things that are lactase, and you add that enzyme, and guess what it does to that lactose when you eat it? It breaks it down, and then guess what you don't do? Fart. Okay? So you do that because you don't want to be embarrassed when you're out with all your friends. You take that enzyme. Enzymes are very specific. So lactose is broken down by lactase. Maltase breaks down maltose. You and I are going to study acetylcholesterase. And that breaks down acetylcholine. And it sounds really big right now, but as soon as you see it, you'll be like, oh, not a big deal. Let's talk about it in public or to your dog or to somebody who will listen to you. Because even when I start talking, my husband just ignores me. He calls me a point dexter. I may or may not be a nerd. What you have here, reactants or products? How do you know the reactants? They're on the left side of the arrow. You see what I did there? If you can memorize that, you can't go wrong. My reactants. Right here you can tell that they're two separated. They're going to fit right here into this enzyme. This enzyme is going to hug them. We call it enzyme hug or squeeze. Look what it's done. <coughs> it dehydrated it. It removed the water. So as a result, by dehydrating it, what have I done? I've bonded something. Is that synthesis or decomposition? It's synthesis, and I know that it's synthesis because it created something. It would be decomposition if it broke it down. Is this anabolic or catabolic? Anabolic, anabolic because it built something. Okay? <clears throat> Could a square-shaped reactant fit in there? No. So that's what I... Let me make this parallel right quick. Lactose will fit into lactase because they're specific. But if I have maltose right here that's a square shape, it won't work with, with lactase. 
Okay, all your enzymes are very specific. So that shape is, is specific in there, and it doesn't say that, but it is. Okay, the last biomolecule, nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. When you say DNA out loud, like everybody's like, oh, it's DNA. But DNA is technically the acronym for deoxyribonucleic acid. What does deoxy make you think? Deoxy. Take a, it's, it's, it's literally taking one off. It has one less oxygen. So deoxy, and then ribose is a sugar. So it's ribose missing one oxygen. Deoxyribose nucleic acid. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's ribose minus one oxygen. It's ribose minus one oxygen. Deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. Did I take away an oxygen there? It's just ribose and as a nucleic acid. So that's the sugar. So here's the sugar, the carbohydrate that's found in RNA. Deoxyribose is the uh, sugar found in DNA. You'll also notice that they contain both carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and we're bringing in phosphorus. DNA is the biggest molecule in your body. Biggest. In one skin cell, I have six and a half feet of DNA. In just one skin cell. And you the same. So every single one of your skin cells has six and a half feet of DNA. All of your heart cells have six and a half feet of DNA. So you have a ton of DNA. It's a very large molecule. The smallest that DNA can be is a nucleotide, and you do have to know this. A nucleotide has three parts. A nucleotide has three parts. It has a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. A sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. A nucleotide has three parts. A sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. So here it tells you what DNA is. Whenever you say DNA to most people, um, they're like, oh, I know what DNA is. It's a twisted ladder. They call it a double helix, double-stranded helix. They can tell you what it looks like, but they, don't tell you, they can't tell you what it does. So, of course, I'm not going to go over what it looks like because I feel like you should already know that because you see a lot of pictures of DNA. Let me point out, and this may be a throwback for some of you if you haven't gone to biology in a while. But everywhere there's an A, there will be a T. Everywhere there's a C, there will be a G. So A and T are always together. C and G are always together. I just memorized that. My students came up with a little thing, but I forgot what it was. Something about car, garage. I forgot what A and T was. But A and T will always be together. C and G will always be together. Um, but what do we use DNA for? DNA provides instructions for protein synthesis. Provides instructions for protein synthesis. Can anyone tell me what protein synthesis is? Bonding. Making proteins. Yes. Bonding, creating. Synthesis is making proteins. Literally, what do you use your DNA for? To make proteins. A lot of people can't tell you that. They're like, oh yeah, that's in my DNA. That's why I have blue eyes. That's why I have brown hair. Yeah, for real. But your blue eyes are made of blue-eyed proteins. Or else you would have not blue eyes. Okay. So, a lot of, like I said, a lot of people see the pictures of DNA and they're like, oh, that's DNA, I know that. But we use DNA to make proteins. RNA, we use RNA as a small copy of DNA. The difference between DNA and RNA is RNA is not two strands, it is just one strand. It's a single strand, so we don't call it a double helix. We just say it's a single-stranded molecule. And... The letters for RNA are A and U and still C and G. C and G stays the same no matter what. DNA is A-T, RNA is A-U. 
Okay? I'm trying to point out exactly what you should know for the test. I, I think we're good on that. We don't have to know. You don't have to know the specifics of protein synthesis. The last nucleic acid is ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Triphosphate tells you it has how many phosphates? Three. Three. ATP is the chemical energy in your body. Okay, chemical energy of your body. As soon as you use it, you immediately start to recharge it. Whatever you make today, whatever you use today, your body will make sure you have that same amount tomorrow as long as you're doing the same thing. But if you do something outside of your regular activities, your body won't tell you to stop, but you'll feel really tired. When you go to bed tonight, it'll say, like, say, for example, today you never ran a mile. After class today, you're like, I'm going to start running a mile. First day of class, I'm going to run a mile every day. How are you going to feel after you run that mile? Pretty tired. And you're probably going to go to sleep, and your body's going to say, oh, my God, Jessica got crazy. She ran a mile. Tonight, we need to give her just a little bit more ATP, but not as much as she used because we don't think she's going to run a mile again. Okay? And a lot of times, that's what happens. It's too, you get too sore. It made you uncomfortable, so you don't do it again. But if I continue to run a mile every day for seven days, my body would make exactly enough ATP, and after seven days, I wouldn't be tired after running that mile. Then I would make it a little bit longer. So that's why people, when they work out, you start slow, and you continue to build up that ATP, and those longer, more difficult workouts aren't so difficult over time. All right, I do believe, I'm hoping that that's the last slide. This is the structure of ATP, okay? Triphosphate. Okay? Okay. Questions or clarifications? All right, happy first day. And I apologize for not being that professor.